Hey guys, Dr. Lara here. Today I am here with Fauda, and Fauda is here uh, because he's been having some uh, leg issues. Uh, his front leg ish front legs have been bothering him for probably about six months now. So we're gonna get into uh, what's called elbow dysplasia. We're gonna talk about um, some of the different causes of it, what it actually means, how we go about diagnosing it, what are the dogs that typically get it, when do they get it, and then what are the typical treatment options and what the prognosis is. Stay tuned and we'll get into that momentarily. All right, guys, so elbow dysplasia. There are four different things that typically make up elbow dysplasia. Um, and it's not all different things that add up to elbow dysplasia. There are different conditions. So there is one that is called ununited ankyneal process. There's another one called um, fragmented medial coronoid process. Um, there's another one called elbow incongruity. And there is another one called osteochondrosis desiccans, okay? So um, for the most part, all these or all these part, all these conditions are different variations on how the elbow is jacked up. And so for example, elbow incongruity, which is the easiest one, it just means that the, the joint or the bones that make up the joint on each side don't necessarily line up exactly the way they should and so then what ends up happening is they kind of wear abnormally and they eat up the cartilage and and so that's the the simplest one um, in terms of how it happens um, ununited ankyneal process um, so that is something that typically <clears throat> when the dogs are growing uh, there's a part of the elbow that doesn't necessarily form or grow uh, the way that it should and so that's pretty much what the ankyneal ankyneal process is. Um, the fragmented medial coronoid process. That is a something where it's not necessarily trauma induced, but there is a little piece of the elbow that ends up breaking off. Um, and so then it's almost like this this little piece of um, bone that's in. That's not almost. It is this piece of bone in the elbow joint. Uh, that I usually explain to people it's kind of like a, um, a rock in your shoe all the time. And so, of course, if you think about that, that's super uncomfortable. And if you leave it in there long enough, it's going to cause damage to the bottom of your foot. Now, imagine if you had something like that, but in your gum. Um, so that's just going to tear up your gums a lot faster. And the last thing is something called osteochondrosis desiccans. Um, we did another video on that condition specifically, and that condition... Uh, is something that, again, is transmitted uh, through the genetics. It is usually seen um, in younger dogs. And so that is something where there's a, um, the thought process is that there's a flap of cartilage that um, outgrows blood supply or there are a number of different things that kind of happen. And so then you have kind of like this like hangnail uh, of cartilage in the joint. And it may not be as uncomfortable as per se a piece of little bone in there but it is still uncomfortable still causes a lot of inflammation and tears up the cartilage so we've talked about exactly what elbow dysplasia is now we'll talk about um, the different kinds of patients that will see it this is something that is typically seen in large to giant breed dogs so we're talking about newfies we're talking about uh, golden retrievers we're talking about german shepherds we're talking about chow chows just to name a few um, of the the breeds out there and so it is something that is typically seen in dogs between 5 to 14 months of age. Not years, months. So this is something that does happen very, very young. Um, it is also something that uh, I think there's one study that says that uh, males are 75% more likely to have it than females. So that's something else to, to take into consideration. Now, um, why did Fauda come to me? So Fauda uh, had this particular history of elbow or lameness um, on where he walks really, really funny with his legs swinging out and that kind of stuff. And <clears throat> he had been to uh, another veterinarian and even a surgeon. And they did x-rays on him. They did 
a uh, orthopedic exam and they weren't able to really elicit any consistent signs of pain. So <clears throat> the, um, the, you know, the, the owners still wanted to get an answer because he wasn't getting better um, and they were concerned that he, that there was something that could potentially be done for him and they wanted to make sure that he had the best quality of life. So they came to us at Heron Lakes and we went ahead and did an orthopedic exam. On that particular day, I thought I was able to elicit pain um, on his elbow. And so obviously first thing for me was elbow dysplasia. Um, the next thing was usually what I tell people is if there's issues with the elbow, a lot of times the best form of imaging is usually going to be a CT scan. And so the reason the CT scan is better than x-rays is because you can typically magnify in there. You can see like a 3D version and a bunch of different angles that you can't see on x-rays. And so a CT scan is going to be superior. Now, um, when we had Fauda come in for his orthopedic exam, um, following that with my surgical expert, um, the that particular day, Fauda was not limping. Fauda the surgeon couldn't elicit pain on any of the joints. And so we ended up doing x-rays again. And so you guys would say, well, why would you do x-rays again? You said that the CT scan was the best. Well, the CT scan is the best, but you have to put them under general anesthesia and it gets into the thousands of dollars for the cost of the CT scan. So if there's a possibility that we could potentially go ahead and look at getting that diagnosis with just x-rays, that would have been great. The other thing was that at the time when Fauda first had his x-rays with the other surgeon, um, his growth plates were open, and at this point, his growth plates were closed. So um, we weren't able to see anything on the on the X-rays. Um, so we set him up for the CT scan. The, sur the the surgical expert at that time said, "Hey, look, you know, based on the breed or his his size, his age, uh, and the fact that he wasn't really able to elicit any sort of pain anywhere, he said my money is going to be either on the elbow or on the shoulder." And so. We did the CT scan today. Um, the preliminary report coming back is that we think that he has issues with potentially both of his elbows, um, not just one, but both. And so in terms of treatment, what we do, surgery is typically gonna be the choice for the majority of those different conditions that we discussed. The sooner you treat them, the better it is for the patients. Now you say, of course, you're gonna tell me to do surgery sooner rather than later because you're a veterinarian, you want, just wanna run the bill up. No, what ends up happening is if you, once you damage that cartilage, there is a very good chance that that cartilage is permanently damaged. And so the issue is the sooner you get in there, the faster you get that thing out, the less damage that has happened to that joint. Um, and so if you wait longer to do it, then more damage is building up in that joint and then your dog's joints are going to degenerate that much faster. Now today we do have the advantage of being able to do stem cells and PRP um, and there's other things coming out. I'm going to do a video on a new treatment that's just come out probably within the last few months. It's a radioactive injection. I'll be pretty interested to go over that with you guys. Um, but these are things, um, the stem cells is something that does help to repair the, the cartilage in that joint and it does definitely give us the advantage of trying to give them almost new cartilage um, that they didn't have before and that wasn't an option before. So we're gonna wait to get the CT report back and once we get that CT report confirming from the radiologist that indeed he does have the, um, the elbow dysplasia then we'll move forward with that treatment. Now, the other thing that you'll notice is that Fauda does have some fluids on. The reason he's got these fluids on is because he had some dye go into his uh, circular, circulatory system when we were doing the CT scan so that we can try and highlight the different parts of the body that we're concerned about and so that we can get better images. Um, so that's why he's on fluids. We try to make sure that we dilute the, all that out. Um, if indeed we do see the the stuff on his elbows, the best form of treatment or surgery is going to be arthroscopic. That means using a camera to get, get, in, to get into that joint, not actually doing uh, an arthrotomy, which is actually opening up the joint. Um, it's still probably going to be a, a pretty decent recovery process or length. So probably looking about eight to 12 weeks. Um, and you're gonna be doing some controlled exercises and that kind of stuff. Um, on the patients that I've seen with the osteochondrosis desiccans, they took about a good 
10 to 12 weeks before they resumed normal activity and they were probably close to their peak recovery. Um, other than that, uh, that's pretty much it. The prognosis is good, um, but you do have to do other things once that is fixed, whether it's stem cell therapy, whether it's stuff like chondroitin, um, glucosamine, adequan, turmeric, omega-3 fatty acids, CBD oil, whatever it is that you can think that helps with reducing inflammation in the joints, that's what we're going to want to do in combination with making sure that you keep your dogs as light as possible. The heavier they are, the harder it's going to be on their joints, the faster those joints are going to degrade. So please, 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 if you guys have one of these dogs that has one of these issues, make sure that you go ahead and you um, keep them light and you're also proactive with the supplements. Thanks for watching. Please engage with us on our social media. It really helps us. And um, have a blessed day.